I was thinking of the book of Acts this week a lot as I was listening to a a video promo uh, by Jonathan Lehman. Uh, Every year, the EFCA, uh, our denomination, hosts a theology conference, and Jonathan's going to be there. And he was talking about Acts, and he said, hey, are you an Acts 1-6 Christian, or are you an Acts 1-8 Christian? And I had Never heard that contrast before. So I pulled up Acts chapter 1 and my Bible. It won't be up on your screen because this is brief, but you know the passage. This is Jesus talking to his disciples and his apostles just before he ascends into heaven to be seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede on behalf for his church. So they ask him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, is it going to happen? Are you going to kick the Romans out? And are, is there going to be rule here? You're going to set up your kingdom here on earth. And essentially, Jesus says, um, that's none of your business. Verse 7. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons the Father sets as fixed by his own authority. That's none of your business. That's not what you're to be worried about, he says to his Christians. But, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So Jonathan's challenge to us was, are we in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, Christian, where we're, we're worried too much about earthly kingdoms and what's going on here? Or are we thinking about working for the kingdom to come? In short, how are we investing in our lives these days? Well, would you turn with me? to Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 11 through 27. This is on page 606 in your Bible. And would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? Luke 19, verses 11 through 27. Luke 19, again, beginning in verse 11. As they heard these things, he, that is Jesus, proceeded to tell a parable. Because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. Verse 12. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling 10 of his servants, he gave them 10 minus. And he said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. Verse 16. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your minna has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you've been faithful in very little, you shall have authority over ten cities. Verse 18. And the second came, saying, Lord, your minna has made five minas more. And he said to him, you and you are to be over five cities. And then another came, verse 20, saying, Lord, here is your minna, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the minna from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. Verse 25, and they said to him, Lord, he has 10 minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, Bring them here and slaughter them before me. And God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it lays our hearts bare before you, that it is a true and just mirror that shows us who you really are and therefore who we really are. Let us never make your word in our image, but let your word continue to remake us in your image. And may you get all the glory for how you help us today to be both hearers and doers of your word. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, the title for our sermon today is just simply Kingdom Investing. And you noticed 
Luke frames our passage or connects our passage to what we read last week. As they heard these things. Well, what things? Well, these things. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. In other words, Jesus' words are still sinking in that his mission is to seek and to save the lost. And because he knows what his apostles and his disciples are thinking, that they believe the kingdom of God was coming immediately. And that's why Jesus is going to Jerusalem. They don't have the cross in mind. They have the kingdom in, in mind. They have earthly things in mind. That's why then, therefore, Jesus tells this parable. Two weeks ago, we, we heard that he must go to Jerusalem to suffer and to die. They didn't understand it. God didn't grant him that grace to understand. Last week, he told them his mission is to seek and to save the lost. It's still not sinking in their ears. So he tells them this parable because they still think he's going to overthrow a Roman government, just like we heard in Acts chapter 1. Not much changes. Verse 12, a nobleman, Jesus begins, went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling 10 of his servants, he gave them 10 minas, and he said to them, engage in business until I come. All right, so Jesus sets up a parable. There's a nobleman. He's going to a faraway country to receive a kingdom for himself. <clears throat> and he gives each one of his servants, all 10 of them, one mina. Now, a mina is roughly three months um, uh, uh, funds for, lab for a laborer. So it's income for three months for your average laborer in that time. Not to be confused with the talent. A talent was you know, almost 60 times more valuable than a minna. So in the parable of the talents, each of the, the men in the, in the parable receive a large sum of money. But here, Really, each servant is just receiving a couple, two, three months wages. With this instruction, verse 13, engage in business until I come back, until I return. Verse 14 comes with a big but, doesn't it? But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. So this is the context in which the 10 servants must do their master's business among a fellow citizenry who hate the nobleman and reject his rule. Now, we're used to living under a democracy. So we, we think of uh, maybe, you know, it's like having a president you've elected and you don't like him and you hate him. Oh, well, no, 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 you don't elect kings. So this is very serious rebellion. This is very serious rebellion. Rebellion. These citizens are in a feudal society. They're under rule by the nobleman under his law. Now, verse 15, the nobleman receives his kingdom, returns and asks his 10 servants to give an account, quote, so that they might know what they, what they had gained, so that he might know what they had gained by doing business. So verse 16, we have the first servant that comes back to his master, to the king. And he says, Lord, your minna has made 10 minutes more. And he says to him, well done, good servant. Because you have been faithful in a very little, you shall have authority over 10 cities. And the second servant came saying, Lord, your minna has made five minutes more. And again, the king said to him, you are to be over five cities. Wow. The first servant comes back with a 1,000% Profit. That is incredible. That is an incredible investment on return. And yet still, it's only maybe three years worth of wages. Again, if one mina is three months of wages, roughly. But it's no wonder the, the master praises him. That's an incredible return on the investment, isn't it? But did you notice the reward he gets? The reward is 10 cities. 11 minutes, roughly three years of wages, give or take, compared to 10 cities. There's no comparison. The, the reward is exponentially greater than the, inve the return on the investment. Uh, diddle with the, the second servant. Here, you had five minutes in profit. I'm giving you five cities to rule over. 
Why? Because they were both faithful with what? A little. And notice their language. Both of the servants say, Lord, your men has made 10 more, has made five more. It's clear these servants don't see this money as theirs. It's their Lord's. It's the king's money. It's a good place for us to pause real quick, isn't it? I mean, if we're identifying ourselves right now with the servants, which we should, it's a good reminder. What we're given to invest with isn't ours to begin with and isn't ours in the end. It's ultimately always his. Now, the original audience would have been in shock. I mean, the, the return on investment's incredible. Okay, there's that. But the, the reward is just unbelievable. <clears throat> but yet, this is the kingdom economics of the king. He who was faithful with a little will receive great reward. Will be entrusted with ruling over many cities. It reminds me of Genesis chapter 1. Remember, God's creation order is for Adam and Eve and all of their kin to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, to have dominion over it, to rule it in his stead. The reward to the first and second servant is more authority, more rule on their king's behalf, or in the language of Genesis, on the creator's behalf. And then comes the third servant, by our account at least. And the contrast couldn't be greater, could it? Verse 20, the servant says, Lord, here is your minna. And you can see him unfolding it from his handkerchief. He pulled it out of his pocket if they had pockets back then. For I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and you reap what you did not sow. Now, is what this servant saying true? I mean, he sincerely believes what he's saying. That's obvious. But is it really true that the Lord is master? The king is severe and exacting man. As Leon Morris puts it, the servant seems to say of his master that he is a man who would expect to get blood from a stone. That's the language there when he says that he is a severe man. Now let's review. The master gives each servant a mina tells them to go and engage or do business with it until he returns. It's not harsh. It's not exacting necessarily. He gives them some money to go invest. Go ahead and do it. Master fronts the money. That's, that's generous of him. And notice how lavishly he rewards the first servant with 10 cities and the second service servant with five cities. This king isn't, isn't miserly by any means and he's not overly strict He's incredibly gracious, lavishly, prodigally gracious. So this third servant clearly does not know his master. Now, if we were to pause here, not knowing what would happen next, what would you expect? What would the first audience have expected? That if a, a servant were to talk to the king in such a way, you are cruel and you take what isn't yours. What would you expect? Well, you'd expect that man just forfeited his life. You don't talk to a king that way. You could talk to your politicians and I suppose you could talk to your principal that way. I hope if you talk to your parents that way, they give you a swat. But with a king, you do that and you've just forfeited your life. I mean, I think that's fair. In a kingdom, the king rules and his word is authority and he holds the sword. But notice what happens. The third man is not executed. Interesting. Rather, the king rebukes him with his own words. It seems he wants him and, of course, the disciples and us to learn from this man's mistake. Verse 22. I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, take the minna from him and give it to the one who has the 10 minas. So the king says, you believed 
that I was a severe man who takes what I don't deposit and reap what I do not sow, then why, you fool, did you not do something with the minna? Why didn't you at least stick it in the bank? Get a little bit of interest on it. You knew I was coming back. You knew I would return. And while you had life and breath in your lungs, you knew I would want a return on my investment. It was reasonable. You could have at least, though you are lazy and fearful and foolish, could have at least put it in the bank and the bank would have done something with it and you would have gotten a little bit, a small percentage back that you would have given to me. But he doesn't even do that. Doesn't even bury it. He puts it in a handkerchief, hides it away, tucks it away. And so this servant who did nothing with little ends up with nothing in return. Now, I think Jesus is anticipating his apostles, his disciples, uh, question at taking away the minna from the one and giving it to the one who had so much. So I think that's why he has the, 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 the question asked here in verse 25, Lord, he has 10 minas. It's as if they're saying it's not fair. But is that really true? I mean, if you're the master, if you're the owner of the business, if you're the Lord of the land, who are you going to give the minna to? Well, the one who's been incredibly faithful and profitable with what he was already given. Makes sense, doesn't it? You would invest it with the one who had made the greatest return. The one who was most faithful. Makes sense, doesn't it? And then Jesus closes with this punchline, verses 26 through 27. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, remember them back in verse 14? So we don't want this king to rule over us. Bring them here and slaughter them before me. To those who've invested what God has given, more will be given. To those who have done nothing, well, nothing will get you nothing. That's the third servant. And to those who are outright enemies, who rebel against the reign of the king, well, they will be slaughtered before him. Now, I think we, I think we know here that Jesus isn't strictly or narrowly dealing with money, but rather, as he often does, he's using money as a very tangible example of our lives. So that minna really represents all that you and I have been entrusted with. Yes, it's our money, of course, because the, the scriptures clearly teach where our money is. That's where our heart is as well. Jesus preaches on money more than he does on heaven and hell because it's something we are each tested with every day. But it's more than just money, isn't it? It's time, it's talents, it's other resources, it's our gifts, etc. Whatever is under our control to give or be given to is what Jesus is talking about here. And notice the attitude of the first two servants. They clearly view themselves as stewards to the king. And what is a steward? A steward is somebody who rules well underneath the king, who is entrusted with something and is responsible for seeing it bear fruit. And that's really you and I in Christ, stewards of all the resources that he's entrusted us with. He tells us as Jesus tells through the parable, through the words of the, <clears throat> the nobleman to be engaging in his business. So that is you too, you and I both. We are called in Christ to engage in his business with the resources that he's invested us with. It doesn't matter how much we have or how little, that's not the point. But what matters is, have we invested it? It's no mistake the third servant is brought up as an example, because there are some of us here today who are that third servant. We do not see God as he is. We see him as cruel. We see him as unfair. We see the circumstances around us, whatever they may be. We see his hand in it, for sure. But we don't see his grace. We don't see his kindness. It's, it's as if one... Uh, 
one pastor, I don't even know who said it years ago, said, you know, we, we often put God, on the, we put God on the hook for the bad stuff that happened in our lives. We don't put him on the hook for the good stuff. We all struggle with the problem of evil. That is, why do bad things seem to happen to innocent or good people? But remember, it's both sides. God's on account for both. And today we're focusing really on the good. What have we been given that we can invest? And notice the reward for the investment is lavish. Now, it's not what we might want as Americans, per se. It's not a lake house. It's not a nice house. It's, it's not a custom RV or a timeshare in Cancun. It's more authority. It's more responsibility for the king. We get entrusted to do more of his labor. We get entrusted with the privilege of bearing more fruit for him. Not for ourselves. That's what that lake house, which can be good, and all those things aren't bad necessarily. But we get to have more of a chance to impact others for Christ, both here and in the after. So we should, at the very least, aspire to be these first two servants. And if we identify with the third, if we, if we don't give of our money to the Lord, if we don't give of our time, if we have bought into the American idea that retirement means I'm done serving everybody, including God. And friends, it's not too late to repent. God hasn't come back yet, but it could be tomorrow. Now, I don't know what God is convicting you of. I know what he's convicted me of, but don't waste that conviction this morning. Wherever you see yourself, Whatever the Spirit is telling you through the word preached, act on it. Even in this very moment, close your eyes and pray, Lord, help me. Spirit, show me, empower me, and then share with your wife or your husband or your friend or somebody next to you. Please pray with me. Help me to walk in this. I've not been giving of my time. I've not been giving of my resources. I see God's Possessions that he's entrusted with me is mine. And I know I need to have open hands and not closed hands. I believe that I don't have gifts when clearly I must. Or I'm online all the time because I don't value being here with God's people to share with them and to be shared with by them. I've bought into the American idea that church is an add-on instead of the bride of Jesus. We should aspire to be the first two. We should aspire as our brother in the Lord who is with our brothers and sisters in heaven. Jim Elliott said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Or as St. Francis says so well, the Christian life, it is in giving that we receive. It is in, in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. In the world's ledger sheet, as James Edwards writes, to give away something is always a subtraction. But in the ledger sheet of the kingdom of God, friends, it's the opposite. So I ask you, as I started today, are you an Acts 1 verse 6 Christian? Do you have eyes only for the kingdom, for the earth, for what's around you? Or are you using what God has entrusted with to benefit his eternal kingdom? And if so, keep those rewards in mind. Our God is not miserly. He is lavish. And his eternal rewards will far outweigh whatever small sacrifices we make today. Let's pray. Oh Lord, that we might believe Indeed, you are a God who rewards those who are faithful. May we long to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. May we be rightly afraid of hearing the words, take away his minna, take away her minna, give it to the one who had ten. 
Lord, we don't know what happens to that third servant eternally. But I pray that none of us would sit on that fence today. Do your work through your spirit and through your word and get all the glory for it. Call us to be your servants all the more today. And we pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.